I would like to thank all of you for being here. Um, I, I think it is a testament to where our industry is today that we have a room full of people here purely for the motive of getting some education about how to manage exotic wildlife on your ranch or wherever it is that you may be keeping it. And <clears throat> our goal as a company, my name is Brian Gilroy and I'm with Wildlife Partners as you already know, but our goal as a company in hosting this event like other events that we've done is simply to provide as much transparency as we can to create an environment where people that are within this industry can meet one another, um, share knowledge, share information, help one another, and to create an industry that's really based on uh, transparency and, and, and trying collectively to do everything we can to make sure that our, our hobby, our passion, and our investment um, works as well as it possibly can. And closed doors don't lend themselves, it doesn't lend itself very well to long-term success for individuals or for an industry. But I've always believed that an open door policy and transparency, it, it makes an investment um, much better. And so I just want to applaud you for being here and for having an interest in hearing the speakers that we have lined up today. And so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, we have, I think, a really great lineup of speakers. Um, there's some really, really smart people, and then there's a few rednecks mixed in. And, and um, uh, hopefully the rednecks can keep up with the smart folks. And so, um, and I am one of the rednecks, by the way. So um, we, we've tried to get um, kind of a foundation of information that we think is important um, for what's going on on your property in lieu of certain events that have gone on just uh, as it relates to anthrax or whether it's genetics or whether it's predators or parasites, but there are certain subjects that I think really matter to all of us if we have exotic wildlife on our ranches. And so the, the, the foundation of speakers that we have for this event are gonna cover those things. So some of these presentations may go a little short and I know others are gonna go a little long. So if you get antsy in your chair because somebody is going on longer than what the schedule is, uh, feel free to get up and walk around or you know take a break or whatever because um, I do know that a couple of the presentations are probably going to go a little longer than what the schedule says so I'm um, just I'm giving you a heads up be prepared for that and so our first speaker is Joe Bailey and Joe is with Wildlife Ranch Solutions and <clears throat> Wildlife Ranch Solutions it is a subsidy of Wildlife Partners and Joe runs this company and so He's working with landowners throughout the state to provide uh, solutions for the ranch, whether it's um, a business plan or whether it's stocking or whether it's husbandry, uh, shelters and things like that. With that, I'm going to go ahead and bring Joe up here and let Joe share with you uh, his presentation. And uh, afterwards, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask him. So this is Joe Bailey with Wildlife Ranch Solutions. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Wildlife Partners Exotic Educational Seminar. My name is Joe Bailey and I'm the president of Wildlife Ranch Solutions. We are a subsidiary of Wildlife Partners. I'd like to start off by telling you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the hill country around Kerrville, was around the ranch and lifestyle all of my life. Um, after high school, needed a little direction. And when I was a little kid, I read a book in the library um, about rangers, army rangers, and uh, decided that was for me. So I joined the Army, uh, went to the Ranger selection process, and became a member of the 75th Ranger Regiment. So that was a proud moment for me. Um, shortly after that, I contracted myself to the U.S. government for several years in a variety of roles, uh, two and a half years overseas in combat, um, various stateside training gigs. So uh, that was exciting, and, and I've, I've never regretted it. Post-U.S. government contracting, I started working in the oil field. I was a directional driller. It was a great step, stepping stone, but I was ready to move on to something new. Um, my brother John is the ranch manager for the Wildlife Partners Mountain Home Facility, and that's when I got to know Brian Gilroy. Um, last winter, John and I and several members of the catch crew, we spent 10 days working 18 to 20 hours a day during the big winter storm to keep 500 animals alive. We won, we prevailed, and the ranch experienced uh, roughly 2% immediate death loss. And uh, that's, that, that was uh, 
that was a big win for us. After the dust settled from that storm and after several meetings with Brian, Wildlife Ranch Solutions was born. Just wanna tell everyone all of the information that I'm gonna be disseminating today is uh, based on the collective knowledge from people that have literally devoted their lives to the exotic wildlife industry. So let's get started. This is important. Avoiding impulse buying at an auction, avoid impulse buying on any kind of exotics. Most people that decide to get into the exotic breeding business, they believe the first step, other than having the land to put the animals, is to buying the animals that they desire, okay? Some people buy animals they believe are the cutest, the most docile, or believe it or not, species they are most likely to be able to interact with. This is not ideal approach to entering into this business. And one of the most common animals that is an impulse buy is giraffes. I'm gonna give you an example. A giraffe was purchased from Wildlife Partners by a husband and wife that wanted to own and raise giraffes. No big deal, okay? Great. Giraffe was paid for, delivery was scheduled. These folks had great intentions. They had done absolutely nothing in terms of looking into what it takes to raise giraffes, successfully raise giraffes. They didn't have a barn, no giraffe barn, no fencing, no elevated feeders, elevated watering stations, and all the other things that go into keeping giraffes safe, happy, and healthy, okay? That was a disaster. They ended up having to sell it back, and, and it, it just wasn't a good look. Another example, we recently sold pin-raised 0.0.1.1 uh, Nubian Ibex offspring to a buyer in the hill country. We went to deliver the animals at the buyer's branch. The driver, the, the, the driver from the catch crew noticed that the animals were being released into a 750 acre pasture that was nothing but a cedar break, thick cedar, okay? Nubian ibex are generally, generally pin-raised and would have probably been eaten by predators within three days. Needless to say, we had to recommend that the owner build pins and we're having to house the ibex until the pins are completed. So there's a couple examples of impulse buys. Um, it can get really expensive, impulse buying can, okay? Moving on to land. Let's talk about land and the crucial part that it plays in proper animal selection. Again, through our collective experiences at Wildlife Partners and Wildlife Ranch Solutions, we see ranches of all shapes and sizes that reflect every part of Texas. There's four large regions that make up the state. Each of these regions are made up by almost two dozen subregions. My point is, Texas is very diverse. The physical characteristics of the land should dictate what animal species you decide to raise. Raising bongo in the vast dry expanses of West Texas is not ideal you'd be surprised. Raising kudu on the open plains of the panhandle where there's no trees is, is just not advisable, okay? Location characteristics. This is a big one. Climate must be considered when choosing which species will thrive in your geographic location. Animals from sub-Saharan Africa will not do well in the colder northern climates without the necessary infrastructure to keep them alive throughout the winter. Likewise, animals like Chinese white-lipped deer that are acclimated and thrive in very cold weather will struggle greatly in the southern region of Texas and other very temperate regions. Topography, okay? Topography is a very important aspect when choosing animals to raise. The amount of slope is a direct determinant for animal resting sites, vegetation, and tree growth. Aggressive topography can provide windbreaks and natural shelter during the winter months. In some cases, man-made shelters may not be needed due to the cover provided by aggressive topography. Predators. Predators are the biggest threat to exotics in large pasture situations. Not all exotics are prone to predation. Gimsbok, sable, scimitar horned oryx, attics, and Arabian oryx are examples of animals that are not generally susceptible to predators. The smaller species, Inyala, gazelle, sitatunga, impala, extremely susceptible to predators, okay? We see a lot of situations where landowners or ranch employees find a carcass or multiple carcasses and they simply write the death off to natural causes. I'll give you an example of that. We had a client out on, out on the divide on the Edwards Plateau, purchased 10 fallow does, 10 axis does. The animals were delivered to a 600 acre pasture. Two weeks later, every single one of them was dead, all killed by coyotes. 
Every single one of them, all of them. In this situation, the predators were surplus killing. They were just killing because they could. The landowner called us, said he couldn't find any of his animals. We went back out to the ranch with the helicopter, killed nine coyotes in an hour. He was saturated. The owner in this case, he was an absentee landowner. He had no idea that there was even coyotes in the area, okay? So it's important to, to know your surroundings. Education, education's key when determining whether there are predators using your ranch as a feeding ground. And later today, one of the best trappers in the business, he's gonna educate you all on the further, further on the finer points of spotting the signs of predators and recognizing predatory threats. Species characteristics. It's important, again, when you're choosing your animals, you have to know what the animal is and how it feeds. When choosing animal species to purchase and raise, it is imperative that one knows the feeding habits of those desired animals. If your property is grassy plains with a few trees, you would naturally want to choose species that strictly graze. With respect to feeding habits, there are three types of ruminants, browsers, grazers, and intermediate feeders. First, browsers are defined as a herbivorous animal that specializes in eating leaves, fruits of high growing woody plants, soft shoots, and shrubs. Such animals do not feed on grasses and other low-lying vegetation. A few examples of browsers, Ibex, Markor, Kudu, Grant's Gazelle, Thompson's Gazelle, okay? <clears throat> Grazers. Grazers are defined as animals that feed on grass, multicellular organisms like algae, other low-lying vegetation. Grazers, got Gimsbach, sheep, sable, addicts, Arabian oryx, scimitar horned oryx, black buck, zebra, cape buffalo, and all species of wildebeest. Moving on to intermediate feeders. Intermediate feeders are defined as opportunistic feeders that forage between both extremes, consuming a mixed diet while displaying short-term or seasonal dietary shifts in response to the quality of the forage. 35% of ruminants are intermediate feeders. Examples of intermediate feeders include bongo, Inyala, roan, axis deer, goat species, nilgai, sitatunga, and fallow deer. Animal husbandry. Animal husbandry is the science of breeding and caring for your animal population. This is absolutely one of the most crucial aspects of successfully breeding exotics. Herd assessment, let's talk about herd assessment. The ultimate aim of monitoring your herds is establishing useful trends. Accurate counts of all game must be made so that a record can be kept of all individuals. I see this regularly, no records kept, nothing. Okay. The age and sex of the animal population must be monitored regularly for the determination of trends. Mortality rates must be established and the, re the reasons for any mortalities must be continually recorded. This compiled data, above all, must be used in management planning it's useless to spend a bunch of money on monitoring and tracking data if you're not gonna use the results of that data to better your ranch and your animal herds, okay? Animal health. The condition of an animal is an indication of the current state of the ranch, period. The availability of suitable food, the quality and digestibility of the food, and the general health of the animal. Determining condition is an important element in planning a management strategy in game ranching. It indicates the ability of the animals to successfully produce and care for offspring under varying climatic conditions, okay? A poor animal's not gonna be able to take care of its offspring as well as an animal that's in great condition. Inventory. Why is it crucial to keep an accurate record of every animal on the ranch? There are a few reasons why this is important. Let's cover them. Theft. Game theft is an underground illegal industry in Texas. It exists, especially in areas where exotics are prevalent. There are individuals and even crews of people with capture experience that make their living from stealing exotics. The animals aren't regulated and there is no shortage of buyers. If someone brought you 1.3 in Yala that were priced 20% below market value, would you buy them? A lot of people would, okay? I estimate that 20 to 30% of the common exotics, common, sold in the Texas Hill Country were acquired through illegal means. 
The proliferation of night vision, thermal devices, have only added to the efficiency of game thieves. If you talk to people long enough, you talk to the ranchers, every, everybody's, everybody's tends to think they've been stolen from, but they're not sure. Why? Because they don't keep an inventory. Okay? Most ranches that raise super exotics have homes or even a lodge on the property. If a flat screen TV went missing from the house, would, it, would you notice? Of course you would notice. Where's my TV? More than likely, you'd call the law and a proper investigation would be done. Would you notice if one Gimsbach cow went missing from your herd? Unfortunately, a lot of folks wouldn't notice. They just wouldn't, okay? They would write it off to predators or natural death loss, something along those lines. A flat screen, a flat screen TV cost $1,000. A yearling Gimsbach cow is worth $10,000 on the wholesale market, okay? But you'll notice if your TV's gone. Most of the wildlife partners, ranch managers, even some of the sales staff, have had experiences with game thieves at some point in their careers. Tad Honeycutt, perfect example, wildlife partners catch crew leader, has literally driven up on game thieves stealing his personal animals from a deer barn in the middle of the night. It's a much more common occurrence than most ranch, ranch owners want to acknowledge. It exists. Growing up in the hill country, I thought that everyone had a dart gun. I, th I just thought everyone carried a dart gun. Everyone had a deer net. That's what, that's what I was used to, okay? Moving on from that, enough fear mongering. Thanks for the comparison on the TV. <laughs> fencing, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on fencing, but I'm gonna talk about it, okay? Effective game fence is determined by factors such as the kind of game, type of material used, terrain, and finances. We see it all the time driving down the road. You see some really nice fence, you see some not so nice fence. They both get the job done. You just have to figure out what fence is best for you when you decide what animals you wanna raise, okay? The height of the fence will depend on the game species which the rancher wants to keep. Generally, the majority of game is kept behind eight foot net wire with pipe line posts and pipe braces. Some goat species may require 10 foot net wire or eight foot net wire plus an addition to keep the goats from jumping out of the enclosure. Here's something a lot of people don't generally think about. If there's trees in your goat pen and those trees are taller than your fence and they're near the fence, a goat will run up the tree and just jump out and he'll come and go as it, please, as it pleases. We see it, see it all the time. Gates, it's the details, okay? Electric gates are nice, they really are. I love them, we all love them, they're convenient. You don't have to get out of your truck in the rain, you don't have to get off Bluetooth when you're on the phone. What else do electric gates do? They break, they break, okay? At the most inopportune times possible, it just never fails. They break most often in the winter, during cold, wet weather, when moisture forms in the control box. Sometimes it gets noticed, and sometimes people just drive off without making sure that the gates close behind them. It's literally that simple. That brings me to my next point, cattle guards. Cattle guards are cheap insurance to keep animals from getting out in the case of an electric gate malfunction. Not everybody grew up around ranching, not everybody owns a ranch, not a lot of people wait for the gate to close behind them, okay? You can lose a lot of money real quick. Seen it happen. 70 inch kudu off the side of Highway 281. Perfect example, okay? Perfect example. If anybody wants the full story, I'll be around all afternoon. Let's talk about structures. Adequate shelter. Adequate shelter is necessary to sustain the animal population during winter storms and other inclement weather. We have found that in most cases, the different species will not commingle in the same shelter, okay? Nothing's gonna get into a shelter with a sable or a, or a gimsbach. They're just not, okay? Shelter construction should be based off the number of species in each pasture in the given terrain. Oftentimes, pregnant females will give birth when a winter storm blows in and the, barometr the barometric pressure changes significantly. They will often seek shelter in these man-made structures 
Last winter, I counted as many as five Axis babies bedded down in one shelter during the winter storm, okay? There was 30 Axis in there, five of them had given birth in a 20 by 24 shelter, okay? They utilized these shelters. Built some shelters a couple of weeks ago on Meyer Springs Ranch. The day we got done with them, the Gimsbach were already in them. Talk about supplemental feeding. Free choice feeding of alfalfa hay and protein pellets is crucial. It's crucial if you want to build up and sustain your herd's health and body condition through extreme weather conditions, much like the ice apocalypse we dealt with last winter. You guys from up north, it's a big deal to us, okay? <clears throat> if your animal population doesn't have the adequate body fat going into winter, they will, they will be more susceptible to weakened immune systems and their chances of survival will be greatly reduced. We feed free choice hay and protein through the summer for one reason only, so our animals will live comfortably through the winter. They can build that body fat through the summer. They can, they can live uncomfortably through the winter if, if they have to, if another storm blows in, they'll have the body, the body fat necessary to, to get through the storm, okay? That was quick and I, I covered a lot of information. There's a lot of details that must be considered when deciding what animals can be successfully raised on your property. And I will be here all afternoon. I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you. And uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. So the part that Joe left out was the sales pitch. And um, so what, what Joe does is um, his company is really focused on providing solutions to landowners. Um, he will conduct a survey, an initial survey on your property, and the idea of that survey is number one, to assess what you have there, but it's also to assess what type of feed do you naturally have on your land, what region of Texas are you in, and from there he can build a business model for you, which includes species and carrying capacity, um, and, and essentially show you financial performance related to those species on your ranch. And if you need things like shelters, as he described, or a barn, or if you need water lines or fencing or things of that nature, um, Joe does that. Um, and the last thing that Joe does is that for absentee landowners, so if you live in Houston and you have a ranch out by Rock Springs and you don't make it there very often, <clears throat> he talked a lot about theft and the concern of animals disappearing, which it is a real concern. It does in fact happen. It probably happens most to absentee landowners, people that show up at the ranch during deer season, they have a great time all winter, and then maybe they don't go there so much during the spring. So um, Joe has uh, put together a program where we offer monthly inspections. Um, we will send someone out to spend a day or two days or however long it takes on your ranch to conduct an inspection of everything going on on your ranch. From that inspection, they will generate a list of action items that your ranch manager um, needs to address the following month. And so um, when Joe's people go back the next month, they look to see if those action items got completed. And they also do a count of your animals in terms of inventory and things like that. And the, the idea to these inspections is number one, to give you a, a constant source of data, but it's also to create um, the, having an outsider coming in and looking at what it is that's going on on a ranch that you may not be on regularly, uh, it creates um, an environment where people are less likely to take something that's not theirs. If people are watching the asset for you and making sure that um, the asset that you have there is in fact there every month, um, they're less likely to take it. So Joe offers a suite of products that um, it's, it's, you know, you can take what you want and leave the rest, but if you have a need for any of the things that he's described, please feel free to reach out to him after the, uh, after the event today, and he would be more than happy to come out and visit with you in more detail about what it is that he does. So thanks, Joe, for being here.